Hi, I'm Chuck Stout, and in this episode of Behind the Wings, we're going to look at the first mass-produced variable geometry swing wing airplane, the FB-111. This is gonna be cool. It's time to go Behind the Wings. Here at the Wings Over the Rockies Museum, we have more than 70 aircraft in our historic World War II era hangar. And one of them is the FB-111A. Let's take a closer look. So back in the mid-1960s, the Air Force was looking for a replacement for their aging B-52 Stratofortress bombers. They already had the F-111 fighter, but they decided to modify it into a strategic nuclear bomber, a faster supersonic bomber. And we just happen to have one right here. So the FB-111 picked up a nickname along its career. It's called the Aardvark. Now, Aardvark is Afrikaans, South African, for earth pig. But this airplane is definitely not a pig. It got the name because of the shape of its nose. If you look at the profile of the nose, it kind of goes down and then curves up. The FB-111 is a similar but substantially different airplane than the F-111 fighter. It is a strategic nuclear bomber, supersonic in fact. It has longer wings, bigger engines, stronger landing gear, and more fuel capacity. To make this episode even better, we have a special guest, Major General Ray O'Mara from the Strategic Air Command, and we're gonna talk about the FB-111. So the FB-111 came out in 1967, and you were flying this airplane just four years later. Can you tell me how you got into the FB-111? Sure, in 1970, I finished my tour in B-52s, and I was assigned to the FB-111 of Plattsburgh Air Force Base. I was a uh, crew member in uh, both bomb squadrons at Plattsburgh. We had about 30 crews in each squadron, and about 35 airplanes. I also uh, served in the uh, Combat Crew Training Squadron as an instructor pilot. I was the commander of the 528th Bomb Squadron. I see the 528th Bomb Squadron patch on the left uh, nose wheel door. I did that for about 13 months and then uh, had the opportunity to be the deputy to the uh, chief of maintenance. So I understand you went from flying the B-52 to flying the F-111. That must have been an interesting transition. Can you tell us about that? There were only two crew members and it was a lot easier keeping track of one other person than uh, five other persons. The FB-111 was a very comfortable airplane to fly. It was uh, newest equipment at the time, and uh, each of the airplanes smelled like new cars when, you, when we got them. It was very agile, it was very fast, uh, it had the latest avionics and uh, the latest systems throughout the aircraft, and including the flight control system. And I had the opportunity when I was a squadron commander deploying to Nellis to go through the Nellis range. And uh, I was able to go supersonic at 100 feet above the ground, hand flying. Uh, the terrain following radar did not have a 100 foot uh, setting. And um, then we would climb out, go to Nellis and land. And on that day, it took me about four or five minutes to be able to get my hand off the stick because it was quite exciting to uh, fly at 100 feet. It was a very nice transition, but a, a natural one going from B-52s on alert to FB-111s on alert. So what are some of the differences in flight characteristics between the B-52s and the F-111s? They were stark, the differences. B-52, of course, was subsonic. FB-111 had uh, the capability to go up to Mach 2.2, service ceiling of about 60,000 feet. We had systems in it like the automatic terrain following radar. Terrain avoidance radar on the F-111A will allow it to fly low-level missions supersonically day or night. In the autopilot coupled to the radar would uh, allow us to fly 200 feet above the ground up to about 1,000 feet above the ground. So what's it like going from an airplane with eight throttles to one that only has two? A lot easier on your hand because you had uh, only the two throttles. And uh, the FE 111 was very responsive, particularly with the five stage afterburner. And takeoff was always a kick 20,000 pounds of thrust in each engine. On my first flight at Westover Air Force Base in the B 52, we were only airborne for about an hour. And one of the wise guy navigators downstairs said, Hey, Ray, did you ever want to fly a single engine aircraft? And I said, Yeah, it just didn't work out. 
The navigator says on interphone, hey, pilot, give him number eight for the rest of the flight. An incredible story. And did he? We got past that. <laughs> Well, I know our viewers are interested in taking a closer look at this airplane, so let's go have a look. Sure. This is a very comfortable cockpit. Not a whole lot of room for storage, so you had to be efficient. The unique characteristic of this aircraft at that time was we had a capsule which extended from that line just in front of the uh, windscreen all along about halfway up the fuselage and then up to the leading edge of the wings. That capsule was our cockpit, was also our escape mechanism. The uh, capsule had pyrotechnic charges, which would sever the cables and the connections to the aircraft, and had a rocket, which would fire us straight up, and then three parachutes, which would lower us toward the ground, and we had three impact attenuation bags to keep it from banging into the ground. The capsule wasn't perfect, but it had a very good, uh, very good safety record. One of the most important characteristics of the FB-111 is the variable wing geometry, the, the variable sweep wings. Would you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure. Again, another big difference between the B-52 and the FB-111, the variable geometry of the wing. These wings are swept back at 72 degrees right now, and the only time it hadn't swept that far back would be uh, flying supersonic, either low altitude or high altitude. If you ended up getting the wings stuck in that position, you'd have a very high approach speed, uh, over 200 knots. It gives you two uh, challenges, one, to keep it on the runway, and uh, two, not to blow the tires. But normal flight, uh, for the first takeoff of the day, your wings would be swept forward to 16 degrees, uh, leading edge slats out and flaps down, and uh, that makes for a very reasonable takeoff speed uh, probably 128 knots. Conversely, when you're coming back into uh, land, uh, you would be at uh, 16 degrees and about 130, 132 knots for final approach speed. There are also quite a few differences between the FB-111 and the F-111s. It had more powerful engines and uh, more weapons carrying capability. Well, speaking of the engines, let's take a look at what was powering this thing. Sure. These are Pratt & Whitney TF-30 P7 engines that we had. Same engine that the Navy had in their F-14 Tomcat. This sharp device you see here would move as you uh, increased your speed to uh, make a smaller aperture to go in through the engine, afterburning engine, five stages of afterburner. After they made the corrections to the engine, uh, it was pretty reliable and uh, actually quite, quite much, a lot of fun to fly. So General Elmera, we don't have engines in our FB-111, obviously, but could you tell us a little bit about this? There's some great stories about the fuel dump valve. If you took off, lost an engine, and you had uh, fuel tanks on the wings, you want to lighten the aircraft before you uh, came in to land so you reduce the final approach speed. We have a switch in the cockpit where you push the button and it would dump as much fuel as you wanted to. It also had a uh, a playful application. If you went to dump and hit the afterburner, you put a 75-foot flame out the back and that impressed uh, the onlookers. The torch was um, bright enough and intense enough that our satellites in space could detect them. This was a strategic bomber and you mentioned about the fuel tanks to give it long range, but I understand it carried its nuclear weapons internally in a bomb bay. Can we go take a look at that? Sure. The FB-111 carried uh, mainly nuclear weapons. One was a short-range attack missile, uh, one was a B-61 gravity bomb, uh, the B-57, and a B-43. Those are the four weapons that we carried. We could carry two inside the bomb bay and up to four external. But if we carried four external, we couldn't carry fuel tanks. So the normal configuration would be uh, four nuclear weapons and uh, uh, two fuel tanks. Fortunately, never had to use one. Give us a little on the legacy of the FB-111. The legacy of the FB-111, our role in the triad was to deter the Russians from attacking us. 
and we were successful. The uh, FB-111, the B-1, uh, the B-52, the Minuteman missiles uh, all stood alert uh, one week out of three. Uh, hopefully we'll get to a point where we can reduce the uh, risk of uh, inadvertent nuclear war by reducing the number of uh, systems on alert in the Soviet Union, China, and uh, the United States. General O'Mara, this has been a great pleasure for me, and I'm sure it's going to be very popular with our viewers. Thank you for coming out to the museum today. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. It's been over 31 years since the last time I flew one. This was a great memory tickler. Now, this is a great airplane, and I know we couldn't cover everything, but please leave your comments and questions, and we'll get to as many as we can. So we've reached the end of the episode, and if you subscribe, great. If you don't subscribe, subscribe already. And please come in and see our FB-111A and our other swing wing airplanes, the F-14A Tomcat, the B-1A Lancer Bomber, and way over in the corner, our very exotic Russian MiG-23. Well, this has been fun, but I gotta get back to work. <laughs>